Well, good morning and welcome to South Point Church. Is anyone fired up to be here? Well, I know I am. I'm, I'm pretty excited. Uh, matter of fact, I just want to say good morning and welcome. My name is Matt. I'm part of the team here at South Point Church. Um, typically, I, I have a confession before I start. Before I start, I, I have a confession that I need to share with you. Um, typically on Sunday mornings when I show up, I'm fired up, smiled up, and ready to go. I'm usually inspired and just can't wait to get up here and like share. There have been a couple of Sundays over the life of South Point Church where I've come up on Sunday and actually been scared um, because of the subject matter. Um, and to be honest with you, this is one of those Sundays where like, I'm, I'm scared. I'm, I'm actually scared to be up here today. Um, and here's why I'm scared. I'm scared that I have friends that are in the audience. I have friends that attend South Point Church that, that are in the military who I love deeply. And I'm afraid that uh, they may misunderstand some of what I'll say today. I, I have friends here who are people of color and of ethnicity. And I'm afraid that I might disappoint them with the words that I say. But I think what scares me the most is that I might not reflect Jesus in all of his awesomeness. And so I'm, I'm, a, little bit, I'm a little bit scared. And, and here's why I'm a little bit scared is because we're in our fourth week of a series called Mad World, Living Sane in a Crazy World. And I would ask, is there a better time to have this series than this past week? I mean, did we not have some madness brought to us by the NFL logo? I'm going to put the NFL logo. I mean, I mean sports, we found madness. And, and here's what I mean. Uh, the president tweeted... The players responded, and social media just blew up. I mean, it, it, was just, it, was, it was just chaos. And I think if you've looked at the news, if you've watched or uh, read the paper, watched the news, or you've gone on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, I mean, it, it, it looks like this week was a train wreck, right? I mean, we could just go, man, did, did this week help our country, or did it hurt our country? And, you know, as I thought about this, as I was praying and considering about talking about this today, and if you think you're scout out in the offense of what I'm going to say, just imagine being up, up here, right? And so as I was praying and considering this, I said, listen, what if this week was more than a train wreck? What if this week was an opportunity what if there was something greater that could happen this week than we could imagine? And, and you're probably thinking, what do, you, what do you mean this week could be an opportunity? And here's what I mean. Think about it. The world is being mad out there, right? They're just being mad. There's just all this craziness. There's all this, this division. There's all this just hostility, right? And here's what I think. You're thinking, like, what, what could be a great opportunity? Wouldn't it be awesome that if this week this was a great opportunity for the church, for the church to show the world what reconciliation and, and, and unity and love look like? Wouldn't this be a great week for the church to rise up and engage our world in all of its brokenness? What if the world could see? What if the world could see in the church, and I'm going to put up here, that unity with diversity is not only possible. Listen, we're not asking that everyone to have conformity, that you can have diversity, but you can have unity. It's not only possible, but that reconciliation between the races, gender, and classes can happen because of Jesus. No one looks fired up about that. I mean, what a great opportunity this week in the midst of the madness for the church to display that unity with diversity is not only possible, but that reconciliation between races and genders and classes can happen because of the person of Jesus. Now, some of y'all are fired up about that. Now, here's my question. When I say the church, I'm not talking about a building. When I say the church, I'm not talking about an organization or a pastor. When I say the church, I'm talking about a community of followers of Jesus. That's what I mean by church. Church, I mean me, you, we, we together. That's what I mean by church. And so here's my question. How did the church do this week? I wonder what kind of grade we would get. In this moment of opportunity when the world was mad around us, for us, to show that unity with diversity was possible and that reconciliation is something that those who name the name of Jesus practice. I wonder what kind of grade we got. You see, as followers of Jesus, we don't get to avoid and hide from the problems of the world. You see, as followers of Jesus, you know what we do is we run in and we engage those problems and we bring God's grace and God's goodness to the madness of the world because it doesn't have to stay mad. That's why Jesus came. And this morning, I could have spoken about any other subject and you'd probably be glad. I would be glad. 
I wouldn't be scared. But it would be wrong. Because as followers of Jesus, in a mad world, we're supposed to stand up and show the world around us what a good and loving God we serve. Now, before I dive in, I need to make a couple of disclaimers. First one is, is listen, I've never ever served in the military. I've never understood what it meant to like leave my family and go on deployment. I've never had to move from place to place and uproot my kids. I've never lost a friend in service of a country. I know I have friends who are here in this room who are pilots. Some of you have probably flown coffins of people who have given the ultimate sacrifice draped in the American flag. And for you, your opinion about the flag and the anthem is legitimate because that's your perspective. And I've never been black. I've never ever experienced the institutional racism and the systematic racism that we have in our country. I've never ever been followed around by the color of my skin. I've never been pulled over the color of my skin. I've never experienced the disadvantage of being black or being ethnic. I've always enjoyed the privilege that's come along with being white. I've never ever experienced that. And so if you're here and you're a person of ethnicity or you're black and you feel like, hey, it was an appropriate way to protest peacefully by kneeling, I would go, that's legitimate. And you're probably thinking, Matt, you just said it's okay for military people to, to think that they should stand. And then you just said it's okay for, for people of color, people to think it's okay to, to kneel. You're not picking a side. And I'm going, exactly. Because here's what I discovered. It's not my job to pick sides. And it's not my job to tell you which side to pick. Now, if you're here and you're not a follower of Jesus, get ready. Just grab your popcorn and get ready. It's going to be good. Just okay. Because if you're here and you are a follower of Jesus, I can't tell you what opinion you should have, but I can tell you what kind of response followers of Jesus should have. And so I'm going to ask this week, what kind of response did you have? Right? I mean, I want to ask, I mean, when we respond, did we do this? Did we say, are you focused on sharing your opinion? Did you get on Twitter and Instagram and on Facebook and at the water cooler in the place, you go, yep, this is my opinion. This is, I'm going to share my opinion. Or were you seeking to understand another human being? Which, which of those two responses? And I fail often at this. Listen, I, I'm going I'm to look you in the eye and say, listen, I'm as guilty as the next person. I need to be better at this. I have failed we, the church, have probably failed. But I want to ask a serious question. Are you and I focused on sharing our opinion? Are you and I seeking to understand another? And you might be going, I don't care about understanding another. I just want to say what I want to say. And I want to say, well, listen, if you're not a follower of Jesus, that is okay. But if you're a follower of Jesus, here's what I'd like you to do. You should consider, I should consider, we should consider. You should consider how you respond. Because as followers of Jesus, your reaction is seen as a reflection of the God you serve. The response that we have, the way that we react to the world around us, reflects on the God we serve. I want to ask a serious question. If we are, if we are insensitive and we are intolerant and we are, um, we're inflammatory, and we tell people, I don't care what you think, go pound sand, why in the world would anyone want to serve the God we follow? So, this is one of those buckle moments at South Point, bing, for me too. Did your reaction this week reflect well for Jesus? Because the reality is, is if you go to work and you go to school and you go to your job and you go to your gym and you go wherever and you go, I'm a Christ follower, then our response is a reflection of the God we serve. I'm just wondering, was our response helpful or hurtful? Because, listen, listen, you, you, don't, you didn't need to come today to hear this. You and I know this truth. We've experienced the truth that is kind of the opening part or idea of our message this morning. And it goes something like this. Without safe space, being divided by our differences is the lone option 
When there's no safe space, when there's no space to say it's okay to be different, when there's no space to say you have human dignity and value even though we disagree, when there's no safe space, the only option left, the single option left is to be divided by our differences. And when we're divided by our differences, it leads to hostility and destruction. Matter of fact, many of you in this room probably are like, I like Abraham Lincoln. Isn't he the one that says a house divided will? It won't stand, it'll fall, right? And matter of fact, it lost him the Senate election, but it won him the presidency. But Abraham Lincoln wasn't the one that came up with that. He was quoting Jesus. Jesus followers, that came from Jesus. You don't have to take my word. We can look at the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus knew the thoughts and said to them, every kingdom, every church. Did you hear that? Every kingdom, what? What's the word? Against itself will be what? What kind of ability to impact the world around us if we are a church are divided? If we're divided by race and politics and classism, what's going to happen to us? It's not my idea. This is what Jesus said. So if you're here and you're a Jesus, if you're not a Jesus follower, you get to go, ooh, this is interesting. If you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, says, listen, we're divided by those things. We're going to be ruined. And every city and household divided against itself will not stand. Listen, division or being divided destroys. You know why division destroys if there's no safe space? Because the only mode you can be in if there's no safe space is either in defense mode or attack mode. And when you go into defend mode, someone else is going to go into defend mode. And when you're both in defend mode, at some point you're going to be like, I better attack first or they're going to get me. And there's no safe space. So the only thing left is hostility. And I really want to ask, did Jesus die so that we as Christ followers could be hostile to the neighbors around us? Being divided... It'll ruin us. We can't be divided. The world and our country and our communities need us not to be divided but united. And what do I mean by safe space? Pastor Matt, what do you mean by safe space? So I want to give a definition today of what safe space is. Expressing, and you notice I didn't say believing, knowing, understanding, agreeing. I said expressing. Because just because you know something or believe something, it doesn't matter till you live it out. Expressing the inherent value and dignity of another person. The idea, concept that every human being, regardless of whether you agree with them or not, has inherent value and dignity because they're made in the image of God. Expressing the inherent value of dignity of another person through caring actions, regardless of your differences. Matter of fact, I want to prove to you that this isn't my definition. I would like to prove to you and think that this is key and core to the gospel. That expressing inherent value and dignity of another person through caring action, regardless of your differences, is exactly what brings salvation to the human race. It's exactly what Jesus is. Jesus is the safe space that allows busted and broken people who are at different or odds with God to be forgiven and have reconciliation and peace with God. That is, this, is, this is what is core at the gospel. We're going we're gonna to go back a little bit. We're just going to give you a little bit of VBS 101, Christianity 101, right? Because this, I don't think this is my idea. I think this is a biblical idea. So we're going to do a little, we're going to do a little diagram right here to kind of just give you a little bit of theology 101, right? There's God. And God created humanity. And God created humanity, all of us men, women, all of us, all different types. He, he made us so that he could be in relationship. Now, God has some of his own stuff because he's, he, he's, not, he's not codependent. And he allows humanity some of their own stuff so they're not codependent. But we are supposed to be interconnected. We're supposed to be in relationship. Human beings are designed to be in relationship with their Heavenly Father. We're supposed to be what? It's not, not a trick question. We're supposed to be together, right? Right? But here's what happens. Man said, don't want that, God. I want to live life my own way. We rebelled, and here's what we ended up with. There's God. We're divided, and we have hostility, and humanity's over there. You want to know why humanity is hostile? You want to know why humanity is broken? It's because we said, God, we don't want you, and God said, I'm going to give you exactly what you want because that's human dignity and value. So God stepped back, and when God leaves the scene, all that's left is brokenness. And so human beings became not only divided from God, but we became divided from each other. 
And we became divided from each other. We created an us versus them. We're divided from God. We're divided from each other. So now we're hostile at God and we're hostile to each other. And when God looks at the brokenness as we hurt each other, God isn't happy. This is what division looks like. Now here's the problem. If God comes to us, it doesn't end well. I want God to show up. No, you don't. God is holy. God is good. God is perfect. God is just. Could you imagine a holy, good, just God show up in a busted and broken world? It won't end well. The other thing is, is it not only does it not end well justice-wise, it doesn't end up well relationally-wise, and it will rob us of human dignity if God showed up because God is so awesome, so magnificent, so wonderful, so amazing that if he showed up unveiled, we would fall and worship because he's God, and it would rob us of the chance to love him by choice. We'd be loving him by force. So if God comes to us, it doesn't end well. But if God stays away, God goes, listen, if I come, it's not going to end well. If I come, it's not going to end well. But if I stay away, we just stay disconnected from him. We stay disconnected from each other. And we end up in a world full of brokenness. So if God stays away, it doesn't work. And it seems like God is caught in an impasse that he can't solve. But the great thing is he's God. And you know what the gospel is? God was not willing to leave this happen. So what did God do? God goes, no, 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 no. Here's God. Here's humanity. And I'm going to create a safe place. And his name is Jesus. Jesus is the safe place where human beings who are at odds with God can come and find forgiveness and mercy and grace. And they can be reconciled to their God. And they can have peace with themselves. They can have peace with God. And we can have peace with each other. Isn't that awesome? Man, somebody should shout amen or be fired up. This is church. <laughs> Jesus allows God to see us in a way that doesn't harm us. And allows us to see God in a way for who he truly is. And allows us the choice to choose to love him. God expresses the inherent value and the inherent dignity of human beings made in his image. Because he sends Jesus which allows you and I choice. Jesus becomes a safe place where we find redemption and forgiveness of sins because what Jesus did on the cross. He paid the price that we could not pay. And this just isn't an idea. This is, what, this is what Jesus modeled. I mean, Jesus lived this out. This isn't just some thing that we read about. This is exactly what Jesus did when he showed up. Jesus didn't talk a good game. Jesus lived a good game. We see this actually in the eyewitness account of the gospel of Luke. We're going to put it up here on the screen. And it says, after this, Jesus went out and he saw a tax collector. Now I'm going to stop here. I'm going to do a little something. Tax collectors back in the day weren't like IRS workers. The nation of Israel had been conquered by a foreign army. And tax collectors were local citizens who had been recruited by the occupying army to collect taxes from their own people. And the way they got paid was by taking some off the top. So not only were you a thief, but you were a traitor to your country. That's what a tax collector. Most Jews in that day would not walk on the same side of the road as a tax collector. And if they did, they would spit in their face. That's what a tax collector was. The worst of the worst. A tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Notice he wasn't in church. Notice that he wasn't doing the right thing. He wasn't helping the poor. He was in his stuff, robbing his people, being a traitor. And Jesus says, come, what? What are the words? Jesus asked someone who isn't doing the right thing to come spend time with him. Shocking. Mind-blowing. Radical. Levi wasn't living the life he should be living, but yet Jesus chose to offer him to come spend time with him. Jesus said to him, come follow me. And then it says, Levi got up and he left everything and he followed him. And it wasn't that just that Levi got up and then followed Jesus and spent time with him. It says this, it says, then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. He's like, Jesus, you're awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a space and I'm going to invite other people like me so that they can meet you, Jesus. He was creating, oh, you guys are so smart. He's creating safe space. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others, and most other versions say sinners, because the only people that would hang out with traitors and robber were other crazy, rotten people. Like me. And we're eating with them. But the Pharisee, the church folk, 
and the teachers of the law, the good citizens who belong to their sect, what did they do? Oh, oh, oh no, Jesus, Jesus, you don't get it. Like Those are the bad people. To his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Now see, most of us don't understand what it means to eat a meal with someone in that century or in that culture or in that part of that continent. How many of you have ever watched the movie Lone Survivor or read the book? Okay, a couple of you. Okay, quick, quick update on what the Lone Survivor is. It's about a Navy SEAL team that goes in to do something. They get ambushed. It goes really bad. There's only one survivor. And the only way that he actually gets survived is there's this tribe of people in Afghanistan that take him in. But when they go to take him in, the Taliban comes looking for him. And they had to make a choice. If they took him in, that meant in that day there was a code that once you shared a meal, once you took somebody in your home, you would share, you would care, and you would protect them like they were your own family till death. And when they took in this American soldier, it meant that they would protect him upon death. And when the Taliban showed up, they had to fight the Taliban to protect him. So when Jesus sits here and he shares a meal, it is not like going to Burger King. When Jesus sat down with the tax collector and the sinner and he shared a meal in the same home, that meant I am for you. I will share, I will care, and I'll protect regardless of how different we are. Could you imagine if church looked like that? And here's why. Jesus said, listen, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, it's the sick. The problem is we think everyone else is sick and we're healthy. Me too. Like, I'm, I'm part of the brokenness. I'm as guilty, like, I, I, am, I am, this is message is as much for me as it is for you. That's why the worst name that they could give Jesus was to call him a friend of sinners. Which meant that Jesus went and he created safe space for those that were different and he gave them inherent value and dignity through caring action. Now, if he is our Lord and Savior and we're his followers, shouldn't we do the same thing? Which leads me to the thing that we should all be doing, a posture of grace. A posture of grace creates safe space. When we say to people, regardless of what you think, what you believe, and how you act, you haven't, I don't have to agree with you. See, here's what we get. We get it wrong. Listen, you can accept people without agreeing with them. See, a posture of grace creates safe space that allows reconciliation and peace to happen. Only in safe space can reconciliation and peace happen. We're to be a people in a mad world that is divided and hostile. That everywhere we go, we are a posture of grace that creates safe space for the world around us to hear the greatest news of reconciliation and peace that there is. There's a God who made them, a God who loves them, a God who wants to be their friend. But how do, we, how do we do that? Like sometimes I get it. Sometimes we, we go, well, I don't know how to do that. Well, great, the Bible tells us how to do it. Listen, the Bible tells us how to do it. Matter of fact, in the letter to the Philippians, the apostle Paul who encountered a risen Jesus, he says, listen, here's how, you, here's how you have a posture of grace. He says, don't be selfish. Now I'm gonna stop here because this is gonna hurt. This hurt me when I read it. You know what I discovered? When it comes to issues, all kinds of issues, race issues, financial issues, elderly issues, sick issues, all kinds of issues in the world that we face. And there are many complicated issues. Most of the time, I'm just selfish. I don't want to be bothered by other people's problems because I got enough of my own and I just really don't want to take time to be involved. Can we just be honest? Maybe when it comes to relation, race relationships, you're not racist. You're just, you just don't, just don't want to solve it because you have life. I get it. Like, we've all been selfish. I've been selfish. But it says what? Don't be selfish. Like, at the end of the day, we're not supposed to be selfish. And it says, don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking as others better than yourselves. Could you imagine that if this week on Instagram, on Facebook, and social media, and at the water coolers and at school, people were humble and thought others better than themselves, how different this week would have gone? He goes on to say, Don't look out only for your interests, but take an interest in others too. Take an interest in others too. And we're going to go on. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think equality with God is something to cling to. 
Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. You see, here's the reality. We have some rights and privileges we can cling to, but as a follower of Jesus, we don't cling to our rights and privileges. We lay them down so that we can serve others because that's what Jesus did for us. It doesn't feel good, it doesn't look good, it's not easy, but the reality is, is that we are to take a humble position. He was born as a human being, and when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself to obedience to God, and he died a criminal's death on the cross. Jesus did what he didn't have to do because he loved us. And if we want to have a posture of grace, what we do is we set aside our rights and our privileges, and we humble ourselves We humble ourselves to serve others so that people can see that there's a God who made them, a God who loves them, and a God who wants to be their friend. What does this practically look like to have a posture of grace out in our busted and broken world? And so this morning, I want to give you four things that that all of us can do, that I can do, you can do, that we can do to have a posture of grace that creates safe space so reconciliation and peace can happen. And here's the first one. Acknowledge our humanity. Listen, come on, come on, come on, come on, listen. There aren't any perfect people. There are no perfect people. Everyone here has missed it. Listen, your problems might not be my problems, but I got my problems. Just ask my family. They'll tell you. Right? And see, listen, we just have knowledge of our humanity. Then listen, no matter how good, how bad, wherever you are in between, that every single one of us is equal at the foot of the cross. Red, black, yellow, white, all the different whatever. I didn't grow up in church and know that song. Someone can repeat it to me later. But we're all equal because every single person in this room is busted and broken. We have to acknowledge that I too am broken. You see, until we're willing to admit to, another, to other people that we're dialoguing with that we have problems, there is no transparency. When there's no transparency, there's no trust. And when there's no trust, there's no relationship, there's no vulnerability, and we stay hostile, and it's us versus them. The first step to having safe space is to go, listen, I'm broken too, and I'm sorry. Just like, I, I'm a pastor, but I need the forgiveness of Jesus on a regular basis. I just need to acknowledge that like I'm human and I'm, I'm broken and we all have areas of brokenness. And just because your area of brokenness looks different than my area of brokenness doesn't make me any better or you any less. Someone should say amen. That our different areas of brokenness doesn't make us less or more. The great news is we're all loved and we all need the blood of Jesus to be forgiven. And when we can admit that and we acknowledge that and we act like that, that we're just beggars who God freely forgave. It creates a posture of trust. Where we go, yep, I got my flaws too. And I'm sorry. And somebody else might be willing to be open up and then relationship can happen. And, and where relationship can happen, change can happen. Which leads me to observation number two. So we need to act with humility. Woo! Man. <laughs> Well, church, I think, we could, I think we could do better on this one. I don't know everything. I love science and quantum physics, and I love space and all that stuff. And, you know, I did, I did that kind of as a hobby. And, and there's something in science called a frame of reference. Do I have any engineers and, like, physicists in the room, any, any, any people like that? Like, and if, you, if, you, if you're an engineer or, like, science, you know or you understand the concept of frame of reference, right? Frame of reference means is that you see something from a particular view. Matter of fact, scientists say that all knowledge is not knowable by people because, listen, you and we will see things from a specific frame of reference which inherently limits what we can see. You grew up with a certain set of parents. You grew up with a certain set of beliefs. You've only experienced these certain things. And your frame of reference limits you. You don't know. I don't know. Can we use it? Can we smile? It's, you don't have to be God. It's okay. Is it okay to go, I don't know everything? Now, this is where I need to be a little bit sticky here. Your perspective is your perspective, but it is not the only perspective. Someone should say Amen. People, can we, can we understand that maybe someone who's had a different experience has a different perspective and that our perspective might not be the whole picture? That our perspective might not be the whole picture and that someone else's perspective might be able to teach and help us learn something. Can we acknowledge with humility that I don't know something and that I can learn from others? That's what humility is. 
It says that everyone has something to offer and I can learn from other people. Could you imagine if we, listen, you're never going to be heard if you won't be willing to listen. Okay, that was too tough. We'll keep going. We'll go to something happier. Practice hospitality. Practice hospitality. To care and to share. To have no string kindness. Where you're kind to someone with no strings attached. You know what I discovered? The older we get, the less diverse friends we have. That the older we get, we kind of gravitate to people who look like us, think like us, act like us, like what we like, vote like, you know, all those things. When's the last time that you had a meal where you were kind to someone that was different from you? Maybe they voted different than you and you sat down and you had a meal and you just, you just wanted to be nice to them. You want to be nice to them not to put a notch in your belt or to win them to Jesus, but to be nice to them because they're, they're human beings made in the image of God. Have you sat down with someone who's a different ethnicity and just sat down and took them out and just, how can I listen? How can I show some care? How can I spend time? How can I be hospitable? I mean, this applies to everything. Do we, do we practice hospi hosp hospitality? Or do, are other people invited to our circle? Or the only people invited to the circle are the people that we agree with? Because if the only people that are invited to your circle are the people that you agree with, how, how do you ever learn and get to see another perspective? I'm sure glad that God practiced hospitality. And Jesus, when we take communion a little bit better, said anyone, anyone who wants to come, come. Anyone who's weary or tired is open to come. He practiced hospitality. Lastly, we live with hope. I have hope. Look around the room. Look at the diversity in this room. I'm so proud to be a part of a church that's willing to, to try this. After the first service, a lady came up to me and she goes, I'm, you know, she was a little bit older. And she's like, I've seen a lot of churches and I've just wondered for 40 years why, why churches can't be. And I said, because it's hard. But I have hope. I have hope that the truth of who Jesus is can unite us instead of divide us. I have a hope that what God and Jesus said is true. I believe if we genuinely begin to love our neighbor and we practice those things of acknowledging and our humanity and being humble and practicing hospitality and living with hope that the world can, listen, someday God will come and heaven will be brought to earth and it'll all be made right. But do you know we can experience a part of that now? That you can bring a little bit of heaven wherever you go. You can bring what's right to whatever is broken. That you and I can live with hope that it can be different. It's why I'm willing to be scared and get up here on a Sunday and talk about a subject that probably nobody wants to get up and talk about. Because it's hard. But I have hope. Hope that God's spirit, when he lives inside of us, and because of what Jesus did, life can be different in the here and now, not just in some bye-bye time. A timer's telling me that I got to be done. So I want to close back with what is safe space. Remember we said safe space is expressing the inherent value and dignity of another person through care. Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what God did? Didn't God express our inherent value and dignity that we were made, that he sent his one, that's called the incarnation. He expressed, he sent his one and only son who died through caring action, took our penalty on the cross. Even though we were different, even though we were separated and sinners, So I'm going to close with a true story. It's one of the craziest stories I've ever heard in my life. Matter of fact, I read it in the Washington Post. It was about three or four weeks ago. Um, any of you heard of Daryl Davis? Anybody read the Post or, or seen that story? Okay, great. No one. This is, I'm going to have to tell the whole story. Okay. All right. So Daryl Davis is a black man. And he's a black man who plays an instrument. And he plays in a band. And I think most of his band is predominantly Caucasian and white. And he was in kind of this dumpster dive place that was somewhere in the south. And he was playing. And after they're done playing, he was sitting. And, and I don't know if he was having a cup of coffee. He said he doesn't drink alcohol. But he was sitting there. And he was talking to somebody. And the guy he was talking to said, yeah, you know, I've never, you know, really talked to a black person. He said, well, why? He goes, well, because I'm in the KKK. And he's like, really? 
really? He's like, yeah. And I thought the story was going to end with this guy like punching him, right? And so he starts having this conversation with this guy who's in the Ku Klux Klan. And what I can't imagine is here's a black man who in our country, we've had 300 years of slavery, 100 years of oppression. He has every right to be angry, but instead chooses to have a conversation to create and he starts talking to this guy. He's like, hey, would you ever want to get together? I'm, I'd like to take you out to dinner. I'm sure that really caught the guy off, off guard. And all of a sudden, as he began this friendship, this KKK member realized that what he had thought about black people was wrong. And he gave up his membership. And then he said, would you be willing to talk to some of my friends? And so then this guy, Daryl Davis, began to build friendships with Klansmen. Not just ordinary Klansmen, people who are in leadership. He put his own life on the line, sitting down, having conversations. And his conversation was never to change people. His conversation was always to create, to understand. And his thinking was, if they got to know me, maybe their perspective is limited and they need a different perspective. Now, in this article in the Washington Post, there were, some, there were some people who said, listen, you're setting civil rights back. And his response was, I have a closet full of Klansmen who've given up their robes. I've created change in individual lives. What have you accomplished? Now, here's the point. What if followers of Jesus were like Daryl Davis? I wonder if we'd create safe space in our schools and in our communities and our jobs, if followers of Jesus, we express the inherent value and dignity of another person through carry actions regardless of what it is. Could you imagine how different our workplaces would be? Could you imagine how different our schools would be? Could you imagine how different our community would be? Could you imagine how different our world would be? Because our reaction to what happened reflects on Jesus. You and I are meant to have a posture of grace that creates safe space so that reconciliation and peace is possible. It's what God did for us. It's what we should do for the world around us. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, I repent. I say I'm sorry. I'm up here preaching this sermon, and I know there are times that I've missed this. I know that there are times that I've failed. I know there are times where I've been more interested in sharing my opinion than seeking to understand. And I ask you to forgive me. God, I want to be a person that when I respond would reflect the beauty and love and grace of Jesus. God, help us, me, you, we, help us have a posture of grace that builds reconciliation and peace, but that ultimately points people to the safest space, the person of Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your grace in our lives. Thank you for showing us the way. Thank you for coming to a mad world to bring peace and reconciliation. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.